Hello everyone and welcome to Emory Professional Sports Network. I am Sean Farshi and I'm sitting besides Arif. And today we're going to be changing the show a little bit. As many of our viewers, including viewers all around the world since we're on YouTube, already know, before we used to cover multiple sports per week in our debate show. However, we are changing this, and this week we are covering strictly topics in the NBA so we can further break down the issues that are going on within the league. And today we will be covering three different questions in order to break down these issues. So this past week, the NBA trade deadline passed with very few notable trades, with the only one being Houston basically stealing Thomas Robinson, the fifth overall pick in this year's past draft from the Sacramento Kings in exchange for players who likely wouldn't be worth a lottery pick most other years. So our first question we're asking today is what trade that should have happened did not happen and why would that benefit both teams? Well, I'm not Daryl Morey, I can't, I'm not a wizard with this trade stuff, but I feel that Minnesota should have tried and moved love early on if they feel they have no chance in re-signing him, such as when the Jazz traded Darren Williams over, his, I believe, two seasons before his uh, contract was up to the Nets. They got a lot in return, and they mm -hmm. should have done that. I feel like a super partner would have been the Houston Rockets. They could have mm -hmm. gotten a great trade. There's Patrick Patterson, Chandler Parsons would have been in the trade. Morris and Delfino would have made a great package for mm -hmm. Love and possibly a draft pick or so. Mm -hmm. uh, who would be at small forward then for the Rockets? How is their rotation going to look like? Because you have Lynn, you would have Harden. Obviously, Love is a huge upgrade mm -hmm. that helps out both sides. And then you have a Sheik. Who's going to be at the three? Well, it depends. If they can keep Chandler Parsons, which I'm sure they would have mm -hmm. wanted to, uh, <coughs> they would have been at the three. Mm -hmm. But they could have always, they always had the great eye picking mm -hmm. up random talent. They have plenty of people in the D League. I just think that, I think they would have demanded Chandler Parsons personally because I thought that he is on one of the most favorable contracts in the entire league. He's getting paid under a million dollars and Rudy Gay is getting 17 million dollars. Who do you want on your team? It's, it's obvious. Chandler Parsons. It's because you can fit four f max players to compliment him. Although, yeah, I think that's a beneficial trade. I guess I'll move on to a different trade which I have proposed. So, I believe that the Atlanta Hawks, with Josh Smith and their troubling situations, should have traded Josh Smith away, and I think that a suitable partner for them would have been a team that is starting probably the worst starting small forward in the entire league in Marvin Williams in Utah. So the trade I have is Josh Smith and center Zaza Pachulia in exchange for center Al Jefferson, who's on the last year of his contract, making $15 million a year and uh, Randy Foy as a salary fill-in, and he is a good shooter for the Jazz, and uh, his departure would open up time for uh, the rookie from Colorado, Alec Burks, and he hasn't been getting time, enough time to develop uh, and show like what he's made of, and also it would give more time for Gordon Hayward, who mm -hmm. has kind of been like left behind almost, uh, because uh, of the logjam between Foy, Marvin Williams, and Gordon Hayward. When you're paying Marvin Williams $9 million each season, you have to play him at least a little bit, even if he's not that good. And I think that Josh Smith would improve the, uh, would improve their shot blocking on the interior, on the interior and their post defense. And him, uh, Paul Millsap, and uh, Enos Cantor would be an excellent front line. They're all three athletic post guys who would obviously improve the defense and the offense. Although their shooting would be a little lacking, but that's assuming that Mo Williams can come back and provide the inside-outside game that they're looking for. And on the flip side, uh, Atlanta would be starting Teague at point guard. They would have uh, Corver and Randy Foy and Deshaun Stevenson to divvy up the minutes on the wing, although that's not ideal, but with their trade assets that they have, It'll give them some three-point shooting to space the floor. And then you can move uh, Al Horford, who's been getting beat up by all the larger and more physical centers. Then they can move him back to his more natural power forward position because he's more of a skilled 
passing big man who prefers to be taking jump shots and maybe making post moves and cuts from time to time. And then this would leave Al Jefferson in the middle and it would be a very formidable duo. See, that's a great trade for both mm -hmm. sides. But I feel like the Jazz wouldn't want to do it because they're trying to re-sign Millsap. And Millsap has a higher upside and probably a better team mentality than Josh Smith. Josh Smith. Mm -hmm. But who's to say Atlanta can't keep him after the deadline? They can offer him the most money. Who else is going to mm -hmm. offer him that much money? Who else is also going to offer him a favorable situation? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. If, is Josh Smith a max player? I don't think he is. And he... I think that they need, both of these teams need something so they can stop being the middling playoff teams and actually give themselves a chance to contend. And I think that while they do want to sign Millsap, and that's obviously a priority, I mean, you would have to sign Al Jefferson too. Yeah. And I also think that in the summer, if Dwight Howard, I think he's going to at least test free agency. I don't know about leave LA altogether, but I'm gonna, I think that he... I think it's a smart move for him to at least give other teams a shot, to give them a pitch, at least to why he should come to their city. And they can offer a sign and trade, and wouldn't L.A. be pretty happy getting Al Jefferson back to play with Pau Gasol? And he also isn't a super uh, sits in the lane near the hoop to jam up Pau Gasol. They can go in and out. Both of them can shoot. Both of them can post up. Both can block shots. And that actually would be a pretty nice combo, I think, and something that's more fitting than having just the big bruiser down low that Andrew Bynum and Dwight Howard uh, were for Pau Gasol. And that's another option they can think of, that that's an alternate option to see if they can get That'd be amazing if they had Tony's system, working with two twin towers that mm -hmm. weren't just similar to each other like that. Mm -hmm. Assuming but they keep them. Assuming, but, that's yeah. also assuming that Dwight is willing to re-sign with the Utah Jazz. He has well, very uh, few teams uh, This would be the Atlanta radar. Hawks. Oh, well, yeah. excuse me, Atlanta yeah. Hawks. He has very few teams on mm -hmm. his radar. The Hawks probably will be out of contention with him if mm -hmm. they lose Josh Smith and everybody if they were to do this trade. However, Dwight Howard only has a few teams on his radar uh -huh. anyways. The Brooklyn mm -hmm. Nets, Dallas Mavericks, and out of nowhere, the Houston Rockets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the and Brooklyn I think Nets the are Hawks are there too because he is from Atlanta. That's his hometown. That's kind of in that lower sort of echelon of where he's trying to go. But I, feel I like still think Brooklyn's his spot. but I feel like Brooklyn's out of the deal because of the amount of salary they, they, they have. Oh, uh, yeah. That's and what happens when the, you give Gerald Wallace 10 million. He's trash. And the lack of uh, <laughs> signing trade deals. Mm -hmm. so yeah, they, they don't have any trade on. exceptions unless they yeah. trade Brook Lopez, which, uh, which I don't even know if they want to do that because yeah, Howard is pretty good for content. It, yeah. And I feel after recent events, Dwight Howard will man up and take care of business in LA and he will end hopefully, up well, with Hopefully in the eyes of LA fans. But I, th I don't know, I think this trade is something intriguing. I think this might help the Jazz just a little bit more. But I think that having that one-two punch down low is really something that only Chicago really has and they're having their own issues by themselves. And that's something I think that can, well, it's not always good to be like, are you better than the Heat all the time? But having these two guys at least gives you a shot. Yeah. Alright, so then our next question has to deal with uh, the point guards in the NBA. So if you are a fan of excellent point guard play, now is an excellent time to be an NBA fan. The point guard play and just the overall talent level of the guys who are starting currently has been something that we haven't really seen in the past. And the rankings are based on, if healthy, I mean, you have to take into consideration. You can't fully assume that Derrick Rose is going to be the same player or that Rajon Rondo is going to bounce back and be just as effective off the torn ACL. But the criteria is if healthy, meaning reasonably healthy and coming off their injuries, um, which, team, which point guards would you want leading your team uh, in order? So what is your top five? Well, at first I would have said Rondo, but since he did get injured, mm -hmm. He's, he dropped down, and I'm a fan of the pure point guard, the one that likes to pass, the one that likes mm -hmm. to elevate his or her team, mm -hmm. his team. So, as Vinny, no, Vinny Del Negro said, mm -hmm. he believes in the Chris Paul system. Mm -hmm. So do I. Chris Paul is number one. Mm -hmm. Hands down, no one can match up to him. Mm -hmm. This season, I would have to go with number two at Tony Parker. Oh. He's having a phenomenal season. Under the, flying under the radar, phenomenal season. Mm -hmm. 
third, this is a little reach, but I would have to say Kyrie Irving. Oh, wow. Okay. He has elevated the Cavs mm -hmm. a lot. You saw, did you see the Heat game last night? I did. It was yes. a great game. Mm -hmm. Three he's points. a competitor. He's, he's only 20 he's years old. He's 20 years old, and he's a closer already. Yeah. I'm close. Mm -hmm. Four will be Rondo coming off the mm -hmm. injury because he can make his whole mm -hmm. team better. He has great court vision. Uh -huh. And five, it would have to be, I would have to choose Darren Moore. He oh, can wow. still put up good numbers. He's putting, of course, he hit his rough patch, but he's moving on. He's got past that, and he's still he's putting great numbers lately. Okay, so I certainly agree that Chris Paul is number one. I mean, he is playing only thirty three minutes a game under that actually, and he's still averaging sixteen a night. He's hitting forty seven point five percent of his shots, thirty four from three, and eighty eight from the line. So he's obviously an excellent shooter. He has the highest assist to turnover ratio. He's averaging 9.4 assists a game. He cuts down his turnovers. He's leading one of the highest scoring offenses in the league. And he's performed in the playoffs. I remember the Hornet series against the Lakers when they got two wins against a much better Lakers team. And it was all because of Chris Paul. And then uh, second on the list, I also have to agree that Tony Parker shooting 54% for a point guard position is nuts, to say the least. And he's actually uh, shooting 38% on threes, which is a pretty shocking thing considering his three-point shooting has been criticized throughout his entire career. And that's something, although he doesn't take a ton of threes a game, he takes one Quick and fact. a half. Yeah. Jeremy Lin for over the past 10 games has been shooting 50% from three-point range. Oh, okay. are we seeing a second round of insanity? Uh, I doubt it. It's, it's yeah. a little inconsistent, but he's mm -hmm. come back from injury. I believe he's going to mm -hmm. get better. Yeah. Hopefully he can do the top five next time we do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's just so many point guards. I also consider like Drew Holiday, Steph Curry. He's probably the best shooter in the entire league. And then, okay, so going back to Tony Parker, he has low turnovers, and he's not an excellent rebounder for his position. He doesn't get a tremendous amount of steals. But when he did face Chris Paul a few nights ago, he had 31-7, and seven, and Chris Paul had four points and three assists. So that's just showing that he can play with the big dogs. He's obviously got a really smooth game. He doesn't have to be overly athletic or run past anyone to be effective. He just runs a high-powered offense and gets the job done. But here's where the disagreement lies. While I do have Kyrie Irving at fourth because he is carrying a bad team, uh, I just think that uh, when Derrick Rose is fully healthy, and not necessarily, obviously, I can't expect that he's going to be the same freakish athlete. But I think that what he did for that Chicago team when in his last full season when he was the MVP, I just think shows that he's still on a level that Kyrie isn't hit, but, yeah. hit yet. I think that Kyrie Irving could honestly be the next Chris Paul in maybe the one next one to two years. But I think that something Derrick Rose has done that Kyrie hasn't done is that he has won, although obviously this is a little unfair because the Cavs are not exactly the highest quality team and in the league. Look at Rose's coach. He has Tom to put up. Yeah. yeah, to help his Maybe defense. But he is offensively challenged, to say the least. And this man has averaged over 20 a game. He was an MVP in his last full season. He carries the load for a very inconsistent offensive team. Carlos Boozer was terrible back when he was yeah. on the He's team. Just now. Well, Dang is in, they're all They're all stars, but they're all on the Defensive they're all, side. They're all inconsistent, too. Mm -hmm. But he has to lo carry that inconsistency. His field goal percentage is low because he has to take bad shots mm -hmm. in the late clock because he has no other choice. And I just think that he also averages more assists a game than Kyrie does, albeit, and it's also a very distributed passing offense, meaning that uh, Boozer and Noah are, are responsible for making uh, passes uh, within the post, meaning that Derrick Rose doesn't have to... Uh, do all the penetrating and driving and dishing, but he still averages nearly eight assists a game. And he is still a closer, although, albeit Kyrie Irving is an excellent closer, but I think Derrick Rose does that same thing. And I am Kyrie next on the list. I mean, he has excellent steals. He's a great field goal shooter, 47, 42 from three is ridiculous, <laughs> to say the least. Oh, That's something you pay five million a year just to do that. And then uh, he's good steals. 0.4 blocks is something that's mm -hmm. underrated. Just to get shot blocks on the point guards, taking the shots and changing their shots. 
is just something that's underrated. I remember in that Bulls Celtics series with Rose and Rondo, the fact that Rose could change his shots mm -hmm. and alter his offense really made that series competitive. Because really, series. that Bulls that Bulls team was not very good. It was Ben Gordon chucking shots from the, out of bounds practically, and then. Derek coming up and having to step up and do everything. Although you have to give Ben Gordon credit, he did hit some pretty big I know. shots. He made a lot of mistakes, but he did a lot of good too. Although I don't want to pay twelve million for him, but he he, he is missing Chicago. And then fifth, uh, this was one that obviously this is rating the top five point guards in the league is really hard mm -hmm. because there are just so many quality guys. I think that what Russell Westbrook has done for the Oklahoma City Thunder, I think in my opinion, although I'll be, if you asked me last year, I would say that Darren Williams was top five. Yeah. But I think that now, he, is, he just hasn't been consistent. He's shooting 41%. He just doesn't seem like, it's, something's not right for him. Maybe he doesn't like Brooklyn. Maybe he wasn't the same without Jerry Sloan as his coach. But something's not right for him. I mean, he has awesome teammates. I mean, not, not Gerald Wallace, no, you don't count. But the rest of the guys, they're pretty good, and he has Brooke Lopez, he has Joe Johnson. He should be averaging at least 10 assists a game. I think it's a little ridiculous that he is averaging one of his lowest assists per game in his career, and I think that I think it's something mentally that's wrong with him, that he's not shooting, shooting very well, and I think it's something uh, physically because of his ankles have not held up. He's getting shots before every game. He's missed time here and there, and it's just... It's not very consistent for him. And what Russell Westbrook has done for the Thunder, he, remember that, I think it was game two or game three, he was the Oklahoma City Thunder. He dropped 43 on the Heat. And while he did screw up at the end of the game, they would have gotten destroyed. They wouldn't have been in the game without him. Not even close. They would have been done midway through the fourth quarter. And then he is erratic, but I think something that is changing his game is now he's moved up from... Uh, 5.7 assists a game to 8.1, and he's also averaging 5.2 rebounds a game, so he's one of the best uh, rebounding point guards in the league, and I think that's something that's important, too, because obviously against a team like the Heat, you got to win the boards, and Dwayne Wade's going to be crashing in to get those boards. And Chris Bosh. And you. Bosh is a one-time yeah. guy every day. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, he's going to stay. Right? He's, he's a great player. He's uh -huh. having a phenomenal season. If it mm -hmm. wasn't for LeBron having this... Insane season. season. We would be talking about we'll talk how he's like great carrying Miami. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not then, carrying Miami, but how great. Well, carrying Miami, Miami in terms of like the post. Oh, yeah. Obviously, yeah. LeBron is the number one reason. And then, and then I think also, yeah, Russell Westbrook has become more efficient. Mm -hmm. He's become, I think, a little better in his shot selection. Be it, it takes small steps at a time, but I think his outworldly athleticism, I think, is what steps him apart. It's great athleticism. Yeah. I just feel mm -hmm. like. He still needs to mature a little bit mm -hmm. as a basketball player. Okay. He has some basketball IQ, and then he will be easily top three. Top, mm -hmm. I believe yeah. he'll be top three, and I believe he'll be the number one option. Not mm -hmm. one option. Excuse me. I'll be, I believe he'll be helping the team to their first championship probably yeah. this season. Yeah, it might be this season. I think they're my pick, personally. And then I just think that with uh, another reason why I omitted Rondo from the list, mm -hmm. I just, a, a, because of the injury, and B, because... I don't know, the Celtics aren't really a Rajon Rondo kind of team. They want to slow the ball up. They want to play. I mean, he is a good on-ball defender, but he gambles a lot. And he yes. he isn't like a Doc Rivers kind of guy. He's an iffy teammate. He complains to his teammates. And they, they're kind of like a grinded-out mm -hmm. kind of team. And they're someone that doesn't... Uh, it doesn't need to have like an elite distributor. I mean, Paul Pierce is so talented. So is Kevin Garnett, and I think that if Rondo was playing in Cleveland, mm -hmm. he would be average. I think. I mean, obviously, he could still get steals and mm -hmm. set up his teammates, but you know, Paul Pierce, Alonzo G, Kevin Garnett, Tyler Hansbrough. See, I feel like no, not Tyler in, in Cleveland. If he were in Cleveland, Rondo would have a better jumper. He would, he would have more pressure to establish his game. Same. As you, I believe it was last season when all those trade rumors were going around mm -hmm. about Rondo, and he just stepped up his game. He had phenomenal games. Mm -hmm. He hit three-pointer after three-pointer. It was insane. Mm -hmm. I was like, he can't hit a jump shot. Yeah. But it was a great game. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe he needs that. I think he might need a different system or something new. I don't think he's going to be a Celtic. Maybe he needs more. Next he needs it. I'm not going to say more added pressure. I feel like he needs to be the man. That's yeah. what he wants to be. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. And then, uh, although, I guess transitioning into our next question, although the NBA playoffs are a little more predictable than the playoffs in some other sports, it isn't like hockey where an AT such as the Los Angeles Kings are going to go and win a championship. It's a little more predictable than that. However, there have been upsets, such as the eighth-seeded Memphis Grizzlies beating the San Antonio Spurs in the first round a couple of years ago, and the Boston Celtics reaching the finals uh, through Game 7 as the fourth seed, surprising many who ran them off as too old and too slow, etc., etc. And this year, a few teams with lower seeds are pretty talented, and they do have a shot to make noise in the playoffs. So our third question for today is, which team has the best chance to make an unexpected run in the playoffs and why? Well, my heart tells me Houston, because I'm from Houston, but mm -hmm. I would have to go with the Nuggets right now. Mm -hmm. They're playing phenomenal basketball, and if anyone, if Todd Lawson, Daniel and Gallinari get on this hot streak, they are unstoppable. No team would want to face them, none whatsoever. As for the Rockets, they are a run and gun team. They pay at a very quick pace. They pick mm -hmm. most possessions per game. And mm -hmm. they have Harden, and, mm -hmm. and Jeremy Lin is actually mm -hmm. beginning to play better with Harden. Mm -hmm. The outcomes are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I just think that, uh, I'll go into my pick next, but I just think with Houston that uh, they're 0 2 against the Clippers, they're 0 3 against the Spurs, and they're 1 2 against the Thunder in a game in which. James Harden had to hit 46 points on 19 shots, which is one of the most brilliant performances I've seen from basically, basically a lone superstar in the league. I just think that, I mean, Daryl Morey is a brilliant GM. I think he set up this team well. I just don't think this year's the year. I think that if Thomas Robinson pans out to be the player he is and they get one more guy and they have the cap space to do it, they could be really, very, very dangerous. I think they could be an Oklahoma City type contender because they have a scoring superstar. Jeremy Lin is erratic, but he could become sort of a penetrating and dishing player who can ignite the offense. And then they have the defensive shot blocker mm -hmm. in Ashik, and you have the underrated guy in Chandler Parsons, who has the best contract in sports in Back terms of the team side, obviously, not for him. <laughs> Back to Jeremy Lin. Mm -hmm. He has been erratic in the beginning of the season. It, coming off the knee injury, it was mm -hmm. very tough for him. And then learning to have Harden's also big deal. This yeah. The team was thrown together. Right. Chandler Parsons is the only person that was on the team last year. Yeah. Oh. He's the only person. Mm -hmm. The whole team is new. And then they're gaining chemistry. As you can see, Jeremy yeah. Lin still put up big numbers against the Oklahoma mm -hmm. City. But the offense just runs so much smoother when he's on the court. Mm -hmm. it doesn't have, the ball doesn't have to go through him, but as long as he's on the court, the offense runs more fluid. Mm -hmm. he, makes, he doesn't make smart decisions. He makes... Mm -hmm. High risk, uh, me, high risk, high reward decisions, mm -hmm. which can lead to great results. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that when he develops, I think it's just time. He remember he only had a quarter of a season starting under his belt, so I think he just played his eighty second yeah. game. I think I think for this season, I think I don't think Houston is able to beat San Antonio. I think oh. they're just so loaded across the board. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my pick uh, for the team most likely to make a big run in the playoffs unexpectedly is uh, a team that really hasn't had much playoff success, and it's the Golden State Warriors. Uh, they're slotted right now for the sixth seed, which would match them up against the third-seeded LA Clippers, and they're 3-1 against the Clippers this season. And it's not, none of the games have been overly close. I think one of them went into overtime. But I think that the Warriors have the best pure shooter in the NBA in Steph Curry. They have Klay Thompson, who's also hitting two and a half threes every night, on average, obviously, you can't hit half a three. And then, small forward, someone questionable position, Harrison Barnes has had excellent stretches where he looks like a potential rookie of the year candidate, and then others he looks lost like he did in North Carolina in the NCAA tournament. And then you have David Lee, who's one of the the double-double 2010, Chris Bosch, he's kind of like the white Chris Bosch almost. They are very similar guys. They have the sweet jumper. They're great passers out of their position. He's one of the assist leaders. And then you, the wild card, which I think that makes 
Golden State stand out as a potential threat in the playoffs is Andrew Bogut. And when he comes back, that gives them the shot-blocking center, which they've needed for um, decades. Mm -hmm. And he's someone that really could be a, a franchise changer if he could ever string together a healthy playoff series and have any relative chemistry with his teammates. The way he would change that defense and make them much harder to score against in the low post would make them an extremely dangerous threat across the board. And then they have Jared Jack, who has had the best season of his career. He's dropping 20, 20, and 30 the past three nights, and he's coming off the bench. And then... Miles Adobley. Mm -hmm. And then you still have Azili and Beadrint and Draymond Green to sort of fill the minutes on the low block. And they have excellent three-point shooting, which is... Uh, is, which is a weapon that can really win you games, win and lose you games. It's sort of their Orlando Magic sort of style where you go inside and out, where you have three-point shooters, and then you have on the low post. And if you're, they're hitting their threes for four of the games, you're done, <laughs> basically. You have two of the best. Steph Curry, I think, is shooting 44 45% from three, which is outworldly. It's Ray Allen type, and I just think it's absolutely... Ridiculous, and while they uh, are eighteen and eighteen against the Western Conference, I think that they do travel decently. Obviously, having being fifteen and sixty on the road helps them because it's they they're gonna need to win road games as a lower seed, and they also have Carl Landry too as a bench scorer, so they do have a pretty sh strong duo coming off the bench. Too. I love Carl Landry when he was in Houston. He's a high, high motor guy. Did yeah, everything he asked he's always. He doesn't, he never asks for the ball. He always, you give him the ball and he makes it a shot. Don't he was worry. like 8 for 9, 20 points the other night. He's just, just gets the job done. And that's something that really makes the difference in a series. Like, some of these teams, I mean, the Clippers do have an excellent bench. But if Jamal Crawford has one of his Jamal Crawford mm -hmm. yeah. kind of nights, then that's a problem. And then that bench spread is going to be very large because guys like Jared Jack and Steph Curry and Klay Thompson are going to be tearing them apart and raining threes. But if Chris Paul has a CP3 night, they're on yeah. the Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I guess, what are your thoughts, any further thoughts on Denver? And what what's going to make Denver sort of like step... We know that every season, I feel like we talk about, this is the year Denver is going to shock the world. And it's just... It hasn't happened. Honestly, uh, they have a deep team. I mean, they have ten guys who are it's probably just starting some more time. They are amazing at home. Mm -hmm. It's the road games that they uh, trouble mm -hmm. them. And they're all young guys. They're most of them are young guys that don't have enough experience. The more experience they get, the better mm -hmm. they're going to get. Del Nori is becoming could become a potential all star mm -hmm. if he continues to improve. If they have the hunger to improve, which I believe he will be. Mm -hmm. I just think someone like. I don't know. I don't know what Andre Iguodala is gonna bring to the team. They still need that, like for example, like when if the when the Cavs like start contending for the playoffs, like that's what Irving's gonna do, yeah. and I think that's what Harden can do. You put the ball in your best player's hand. hands, and you let cause James Harden can score at anyone, even in the finals games where they were down a ton of points. Mm -hmm. This man would just make threes in people's faces. It was ridiculous. I know. I'm so glad Daryl got it. <laughs> All right, and I guess that's all for the show today. I hope you all enjoyed hearing about hypothetical trades, deciphering the excellent point guard play that's been going on in the NBA. I mean, there are just tons of excellent starting point guards. And our predictions for the next Cinderella playoff team. For Emory Professional Sports Network, this is Sean Farshi. Thank you so much for watching, and good night.